Kirikoto. Thank you very much for having us here. Um, so today me and Kate are going to talk about some results from the New Zealand Crime and Victim Survey, uh, specifically focusing on offences by family members uh, and young adults. Um, to give you a brief outline of what we're going to talk about, uh, I'm going to give you a brief overview of what the New Zealand Crime and Victim Survey is and does. Um, then I'm going to give you some sort of high-level results um, about offences against young adults. Uh, and then Kate is going to talk you through um, some of our data on offences by family members um, and give you a little bit of a rundown on our future plans. So um, why do we need a crime and victim survey? The main reason we need a crime and victim survey is that 75% of crime incidents are not reported to the police. Um, and so that means that police admin data is really only, only focusing on about 25% of crime uh, incidents. Uh, the other thing that a crime and victim survey does is for police admin data, it focuses a lot on offenders. Um, so with a survey, we are able to catch or collect uh, a richer source of information uh, about victims' experiences uh, and perceptions uh, and compare that to non-victims. A uh, brief rundown of the survey, uh, we talked to 8,000 people um, aged 15 plus each year. Um, it's a national survey, uh, randomly selected households across the country uh, using Stats New Zealand mesh blocks. Uh, we generally get an 80% uh, response rate. Uh, the surveys are face-to-face -face, uh, using CAPI and CASI, meaning some uh, questions are asked by the interviewer. Uh, and some more sensitive questions are filled out on an iPad by the respondent. Uh, so far, we have three years of data, um, starting from 2018, uh, and the fourth cycle is currently in the field. So when we go to people's houses and we ask about uh, what's happened to them in terms of victimization, we don't, we cover the last 12 months up to the time of that interview. Uh, and we don't ask them, uh, has a burglary happened to you? Has an assault happened to you? Uh, we ask about scenarios. So we say, has somebody been on your property without your permission uh, and taken something? Uh, has somebody hurt you in any way? Uh, and then what we do, if they say yes to any of those screeners, uh, is that we get a description of that incident, uh, and then we code that incident uh, as an offence or not an offence um, in line with police protocols. Uh, and then we also ask uh, whether that offence was reported to the police or not, or whether that incident was reported to the police or not. Um, some features of the survey is that we have a Maori booster sample uh, to make this the, the survey more representative uh, for Maori. Um, uh, we we let uh, sorry we let people uh, bundle um, incidents together. So in previous surveys. Um, people weren't allowed to cluster incidents together uh, in this survey. If people had a lot of things happen to them, we let them bundle them into um, a cluster victim form so that they can talk about um, a lot of incidents together. Um, and that just lets us collect more information about what's happened to someone in the last year. Uh, each year we have an in-depth module um, which changes from year to year. So one year it was about, in the second year it was about uh, well-being and perceptions of the criminal justice system um, and uh, last year was about um, help seeking uh, for victims of family violence um, and all our coding is supported by New Zealand police so that we know that what we are calling an offence is the same thing that police are calling an offence. So looking at sort of high level victimisation uh, over the last three years these are the uh, incidents and prevalence rates. Uh, on the high level, we haven't seen a big change uh, in victimization. So about 30% of the population experiences uh, an offence each year. Um, we have, after COVID-19, uh, seen a drop uh, in household offences and specifically burglary. Um, but that drop hasn't had enough of an impact to affect the, the higher level offences. Um, so now I'm just going to give you sort of uh, an overview of some, some high level sort of data or results that we have 
on 15 to 19 year olds. Uh, in some cases, I also talk about 20 to 29 year olds, uh, just as the, the next oldest group. Um, and sometimes I'll be combining those two groups together. Um, because the, the data, the victimization rate hasn't changed very much, over the last three years, we'll be mostly focusing on pooled data. So combining our three years of data together to give, to give us more information. So this is our uh, overall rate uh, of victimization uh, for personal offenses by age. Um, so these are prevalence rates, and I should point out that the orange bars uh, mean statistically significant difference from the New Zealand average. Um, so what this graph is showing is that 20% uh, of 15 to 19 year olds experienced uh, a personal offence within the last 12 months uh, compared to 15% for the New Zealand average. Um, and you'll see that uh, as people get older, uh, there's a downward trend. People are less likely to get victimised uh, with 65 years and older, 9% uh, experiencing an offence within the last 12 months. Uh, this is a terrible graph, um, but I'm going to sort of talk you through it. Uh, if you look from left to right, uh, what I've done here is basically um, just comparing that 15 to 19 year old group uh, to the New Zealand average by offence type. Um, so on the far left we have interpersonal violence, uh, where 15 to 19 year olds are almost twice as likely uh, to experience interpersonal violent offences. Uh, looking at burglary, uh, 15 to 19 year olds uh, not that much more likely than the New Zealand average to experience a burglary. Uh, more likely to experience theft and damage offences. Um, not more likely to experience vehicle offences. Uh, and so you can imagine with these property offences, as you're younger, you have less property, so you're probably less likely to experience property offences. Um, fraud and cybercrime actually significantly less likely to experience fraud and cybercrime offences. Uh, not sure why that is. It may be a tech-savvy tech type thing. Um, and finally, sexual assault. Um, so over double, uh, over twice as likely to experience sexual assault within a 12-month period. Uh, and finally, at the end here, we have highly victimised. So it's not quite significant, um, but that 15 to 19-year-old age bracket is more likely to be uh, highly victimised. Um, and what we mean by highly victimised is someone who has experienced uh, four or more offences within a 12-month period. So um, if we look at this a little bit by demographics, for this age group, um, females of the 15 to 19 year old age group are more likely to experience personal offences compared to the New Zealand average uh, versus males of this age group. Um, they're still both high and the error bars are quite high when we're breaking the groups down by this much, um, but the trend is just for females to be a bit higher. Um, when we look at disabilities, uh, we see quite stark differences by age. So when we look uh, at disability overall, um, disabled versus non-disabled, we don't actually see a difference in victimisation. But when we break it down by age, we actually see quite huge differences. The reason for this is, is that the disabled population tend to be older, um, and older people tend to be uh, less likely to be victimised than the average. Um, so when you do break it down by age, you see these quite uh, huge differences for young adults with disabilities. Um, so 50% um, experiencing crime within a 12 month period compared to 30% average, New Zealand average. Um, for those age groups broken down by ethnicity, um, we see uh, Maori 15 to 19 and 20 to 29 um, more likely to experience um, any type of offence, any victimisation. Uh, and the same for New Zealand European, 20 to 29 years old. Um, but we don't get the same uh, Pacific uh, and Asian uh, more commensurate with the New Zealand average for those age groups. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but we have a couple of questions in the survey uh, that are not about the 12 month period, they're about the lifetime. Um, so we ask about lifetime sexual assault and we ask about lifetime intimate partner violence. Um, 
And so we get quite stark results for young people on sexual assault. So two in 10 adults, about 18% in that 15 to 19 year age range had been subject to sexual assault in their lifetime. Um, one in four, when you break that down by sex, it's one in four females or 27% and one in nine males, uh, 12%. So despite these sort of higher rates of victimization uh, for this younger age group, um, young people aren't typically less trusting uh, than other age groups. Uh, so when we asked them, how often do you expect most people to take advantage, um, they're very similar to the other groups and how much they say a little of the time uh, or none of the time. Um, Young people 15 to 19 years old also tend to feel a lot safer, uh, paradoxically, than other age groups. So we've got about 65% um, uh, of 15 to 19 year olds are rating their feelings of safety as a 9 or a 10 uh, out of 10. Um, and the next highest group there is the actual safest group, which is the 65 years plus group, and that's only 54%. Um, so that might be showing us sort of a a feeling of invincibility uh, that young people tend to have. Uh, finally, um, when we ask people of this age group if they saw a crime incident, how likely would they be to report it? Uh, 15 to 19 year olds uh, are the least likely to say that they'd be very likely to report an incident that they witnessed. Uh, so 58% uh, said they would be very likely to report an incident. Uh, all the other age groups are a lot higher, starting at 68% for the 20 to 29 year group. Um, and when you compare this to what actually happens in terms of reporting rates, um, true to their word, uh, younger people are less likely to report offences that happen to them. So we're only seeing about 17% of incidents uh, being reported to police by 15 to 19 year olds. Um, versus that 26% uh, reporting rate average. Um, so that's basically some high level results that we have uh, on young people from the survey. I'm now going to pass it on to Kate Preston to talk about some of our data on uh, offences by family members. Kia ora koutou. it's great to be here today. As Tag said, I'm going to walk you through some of our results about offences by family members, and I'm also going to be focusing on our pooled data that's using three years of data combined together because we don't see much change in the high level rates of these offences over time, and we are working with quite small sample sizes for, for these types of offences. So, <coughs> excuse me, so more than a quarter of interpersonal violence offences, actually around a third were by family members. When I talk about interpersonal violence offences, I'm covering uh, physical violence, sexual assault, threats and harassment, and property damage. Uh, so we see here that about 7% of New Zealanders had an interpersonal violence offence over the last 12 months. And within that, around 2% had an offence by a family member and about 5% by someone else they knew or a stranger. Uh, we have a definition in the NZCVS for offences by family members, which is very similar to what I just described for interpersonal violence. We just treat uh, some of the property damage offences slightly differently. Um, so it includes episodes of these kinds of offences in the last 12 months where the perpetrator was a partner, ex-partner or other family or whanau member of the victim. This is a very offence-based measure, uh, so this is why we don't call it family violence in our reporting, uh, because family violence encompasses a much wider range of patterns of behaviour that cause harm or, or can coerce or control the person. Uh, the survey takes a very incident-based approach uh, and collects about specific episodes uh, of these offences. So around 1 in 50 or 2% of adults had been affected by one of these offences by a family member in the last 12 months. Uh, that's about 90,000 adults and together they experienced around 240,000 offences. Uh, 
So they make up about 7% of all victims in our survey and about 14% of all offences, uh, showing that they experience kind of a disproportionate burden of victimisations. Around three quarters of the offences against family members were by intimate partners, uh, and the rest being by other family and whanau members. Intimate partners include current partners and ex-partners. And about four in 10 of the offences were physical assaults or robbery, or what we grouped together as physical violence. Three in 10 were threats and harassment. Two in 10 were sexual assaults, and one was property damage. We get asked quite a lot about the overlap of offences by family members and sexual assault. So you see here that, as I said, 2 in 10 or 20% of offences by family members were sexual assaults. And similarly, around 25% were of offences by family members were sexual assaults. Now that's mostly being perpetrated by intimate partners when I, where it's family members perpetrating a sexual assault. Um, and overall, sexual assault is, um, more than half of sexual assaults are by someone that the victim already knew before it happened. Offences by family members are highly gendered. Uh, I'm sure many of you will be aware of that already. Uh, women were three times as likely as men to experience an offence by family members in the last 12 months. They were four times as likely to experience an offence by an intimate partner. 70, I think 75% or 70%-ish of uh, offences were perpetrated by men against women. And all population groups are at risk, so men, women, uh, all of our groups show rates of offences by family members that we look at, but some really carry a disproportionate burden of this harm. Uh, a particularly high risk group are people who have the marital status of being separated, this is at the time of the interview, not necessarily at the time of the offending. They could have separated since the offending happened. Uh, so compared to 2% of adults in the population, around 11% of them were victims. I think for young 15 to 29 year olds, that increases to about 24%. Um, bear in mind some high confidence intervals for some of these small groups. Uh, Single parent households, also at high risk. Households with four or more children, uh, those living in government rental accommodation, uh, other high risk groups included Māori women, um, sort of any interactions of these things with women, <laughs> very high risk groups. Uh, adults with disabilities were three times as likely as other adults to have been a victim of offences by family members once we account for age. So as Taig said, uh, uh, older population is at lower risk of, of most offending, but um, once if we, if we imagined the, pop, the disabled population having the same age structure as the overall population, we would expect them to be at three times the higher the risk of the average New Zealander. Uh, just over half of all the adult victims lived in households with children. So I think that's around 60,000 or so of our victims were living in households with children. Uh, women were at higher risk of being a victim if they lived with children, about twice the average risk. Whereas for men, there was no difference by whether or not they were living with children. Fifteen to nineteen year olds are at sort of slightly higher risk than average of being a victim of offences by family members out of all adults, uh, but that's not a significantly signif statistically significant difference at three percent compared with two percent in the overall population. Uh, our twenty to twenty nine year old group is at significantly higher risk. I think their rate is around four percent, and then it drops off again as people get older. Um, 
This graph just shows sort of the makeup of victims. So about 7,000 were 15 to 19 year olds, making up about 8% of all adult victims. Uh, so despite the lower risk for our 30 to 64 year old group, they make up the bulk of our victims because they're such a large group in our population. I mentioned we have some questions on lifetime rates as opposed to 12 month victimization. This uh, picture here talks about lifetime intimate partner violence, either being uh, experiencing force or violence by a partner or ex-partner or threats of force of, or violence by a partner or ex-partner. Uh, again, we see very high rates for women in their lifetime. Uh, also, a lot of men have experienced intimate partner violence in their lifetime. Uh, some other high-risk groups are uh, uh, people with diverse sexualities, um, highlighting that uh, intimate partner violence doesn't just occur in same-sex relationships. About a third of offences by family members, going back to our 12-month measure now, are reported to police. That's a little bit higher than the average offence. Um, there was no difference by whether the perpetrator was a partner or another family member. And common reasons given for not reporting were that it was a private matter, um, a personal or family or whānau matter, or that it was uh, too trivial, or there was no loss or damage, or it wasn't worth reporting. I think uh, shame and humiliation also come up as quite common reasons for these offence types too. Uh, this uh, result is only from our last year of data because it's a new question. One in six adults knew of someone else who had experienced a family or whānau incident in the last 12 months. And about 55% of those then went on to have further involvement with the person they knew. Uh, so we're going to do a little bit more exploration of some other questions we added about uh, barriers to helping those people or what kind of involvement they, they had. But I think this highlights a, a point of help for, for many of our victims uh, to get, and we need to be able to resource our communities to support those who are experiencing harm. We have lots of other information in the survey on uh, victims' experiences, uh, how much, how often alcohol or drugs were involved in the offence, uh, factors related, so we commonly hear that separation and arguments were factors in these offences, uh, the types of emotional reactions, uh, depression and anxiety, quite a lot of our victims said they experienced these as a result of the offences. We have information on whether they were injured, whether they sought medical treatment, uh, and whether they perceived the incident to be a crime or not, uh, and how serious they thought it was. Uh, these are available on our data tables and reports online, but I don't have time to go through these all today. Um, I'm going to just finish up highlighting some of our reports that are available on our website. Our Cycle 3 report was published in June and has lots of information, including a chapter on family and sexual violence and lots of information about our young populations. Uh, TAIG produced a report on Māori victimisation that is up on the website too. And we have a report on victims' perceptions of the criminal justice system, where we showed that victims of interpersonal violence, sexual violence and offences by family members have some of the lowest perceptions of the criminal justice system in our population. We're still collecting data right now and we'll be reporting on that in the next year. Uh, that uh, includes some new questions on controlling behaviours, trying to look at uh, offences out beyond the scope of offences uh, in family violence. And we're working with the New Zealand Police in our current Cycle 4 with a new module on uh, public perceptions of the police. And our data is in the IDI, so that's the integrated data infrastructure linked into administrative data sets. And we'd encourage you all to 
uh, consider research projects you might like to use this data for and connect it to your own administrative data sets and we welcome you to have a chat with us about how we can help you to do that. So look forward to hearing from any of you about that and that's, that's all I have for you today. So thank you Namihi for having us today.